Oh, Before excuse we get me. started, I, yeah, I, I want to uh, remind you uh, or just mention that our next seminar, a month from now, will be Kevin McClain from the Idaho National Laboratory, who's going to be talking about carbon sequestration in the human dome. So that will be pretty interesting. And I have a surprise special guest to introduce our speaker today, Tom Patton, director of Research. The surprise is mine. <laughs> About five minutes ago, she says, Tom, would you? So I'm surprised. I don't know if you're surprised. I'm surprised you said yes. I'm surprised I've said yes. I'm kind of surprised nobody wants to introduce you. <laughs> Anybody else want to be surprised? Okay. Anyway, uh, I, I am pleased to, to uh, introduce uh, John Lefebvre. He's the director of our groundwater assessment program. And he's carrying on with uh, some long-term work uh, uh, with a monitoring network that we started developing, I think, in about 1990. And as many of you will become aware, if you're not already, uh, little snippets of hydrogeology as measured by water level records does not tell you very much of the story. And you need a decadal length record or multi-decadal length record to see parts of these stories. So I'm going to give you John. John has been at the Bureau for uh, pretty much 20 or 21 years. He, uh, for those inside the house, he coined the term Lefebian orbit which means you work here for a while, go out to the Oort cloud, and then orbit back in and take the job again and stick. Yeah. John, John coined that term. Uh, he has a Bachelor's of Science in Geology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My writing is poor, so we'll work on that a little bit. And a Master's of, in Geology from the University of Texas in Austin. So, no further along, here's John. Thank you. Or here's Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> Is that good? good? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tom and Colleen. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be starting off a new year of the Montana Tech Public Lecture Series. And, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Montana's groundwater resources and some of the things we've learned through our long term monitoring network. And, as you may or may not know, groundwater represents the largest available reservoir of uh, fresh water on the planet. But, but it's below the ground. It's out of mind. It's out of sight. We don't see it. We don't. We don't. We, we can't. You know, uh, connect with it like a uh, Montana trout stream or Flathead Lake. Um, and I think this quote kind of speaks to that. You know, if, ground, if water would just stay above the surface, all, all our water problems would be pretty easy to figure out. But water, of course, does penetrate uh, uh, below the surface. And it does represent a very important resource for Montana. Um, so just how important? This map shows the distribution of wells that are pumping water out of aquifers in Montana. And if you take a look at that, I think one of the first things that strikes one is that the distribution of wells, uh, the density of wells, kind of reflects population density, not unsurprisingly. <clears throat> Um, you know, we see we see large concentrations of wells. Whoop! Now I did it. We see large concentrations of wells in, in the Gallatin Valley, the Hel uh, up around Helena, Missoula, the, the Bitterroot Valley, the Flathead Valley, around the Billings. But the, the distribution of wells also reflects the underlying geology. We see. Um, Lot, we see these dense concentration of wells pumping water out of alluvial deposits in the intermontane basins in the west. We see um, the alluvial deposits of major river valleys serving as major aquifers. We see um, some of the, the bedrock aquifers. This orange represents where there's Port Union formation at the surface. We see there are a lot of wells in the Port Union formation. We see a lot of wells in the, in the bright green. These represent upper Cretaceous sandstone aquifers. Where we don't see wells are in these olive drab areas. These are the Cretaceous shales that underlie all the other parts of the state. So um, we have a lot of wells. Uh, and any any guesses on how many? Think about it. I'll give you the answer in a minute. Um, so we have we have this varied geology across our state, which results in varied aquifers. 
we have um, a very climatic regime across the state, which results in different recharge regi regimes across the state. We have different development pressures and different development histories on our aquifers. And all those things combined to result in variable aquifer system responses as reflected by these are hydrographs, different hydrographs from, from wells across the state. And one of the takeaways that I hope you get from this presentation is that aquifer systems are, are dynamic. They will dynamically adjust to changes in stresses, be it climate or, or development pressure. But the only way we can really understand how these aquifer systems work is with um, through, through systematic long-term water level measurements. This is sort of the fundamental data that we need to understand how these groundwater, uh, to understand our groundwater resources. Um, so a quick word from our sponsor before we go any further. This, the, the, what I'm going to be showing you today are products from the Groundwater Assessment Program. The Groundwater Assessment Program was put here at the Bureau with the passage of the Groundwater Assessment Act in 1991, where the, the the legislature at that time recognized that groundwater is an important resource in Montana and basically we don't know a lot about it. So they put this program at the Bureau to do systematic evaluation, characterization of groundwater resources across the state and then make that information available. And so our, this program has three parts to it. Characterization program where we'll do reconnaissance scale evaluations, uh, cover areas two to five counties in size and just try to piece together the hydrogeologic framework of these areas. And then the monitoring program to, um, this is going to be the main uh, part of my discussion today, um, to, to put this, uh, develop a network of wells around the state so we can track long-term changes in water levels and water quality. And then the third part, which really, um, uh, you know, the information is no good if people don't use it. So the third part is to make this information available, and we do that through our Groundwater Information Center. And so the, the Groundwater Information Center has become sort of the official repository for groundwater information in Montana. Well, if you drill a water well at your house, the driller is required to fire a well log. It gets put into the database. All the information that we collect as part of our program and other programs at the Bureau are put in the database, and it's all available um, online. Okay, so back to the regular programming. We have about 200,000 wells that are pumping water out of the state's aquifers. Any idea what most of those wells are used for? Single family homes. Yeah, domestic wells. Domestic wells. Um, second most, stock water wells. Third most, there we go. <laughs> More tradable. Yeah. <laughs> so by far, by far, most of the, the reported use of these wells, by far, most of them are domestic wells. Second most, stock water wells. So, so these two categories of wells, domestic and stock, constitute more than 90% of the wells that you're seeing up here. The rest, this little, these little small slivers here, oh, darn it. Why do they put that button there? <laughs> the, rest, the rest are, we've got uh, irrigation wells, public water supply, and industrial wells, representing about you know, 6%, pretty, pretty small sliver. But when we look at the withdrawals, it's a different story. Most of the, the, the that 90% of the well, you know, 90 plus percent of the wells of, of uh, domestic water, they account for about 10% of the withdrawals. 10% of the wells roughly account for 10% um, of the wells account for roughly 90% of the withdrawals. So most of the withdrawals um, are for irrigation wells, uh, public water supply wells, and industrial wells. And now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We don't use much groundwater in Montana, especially as compared to surface water. If we look at the groundwater withdrawals relative to the surface water withdrawals in the state, we pump around 300 million gallons of water a day. We divert almost 10 billion gallons of, water, of surface water a day. But most of these diversions are for irrigation water. Right? Does that mean groundwater is not important? Of course not. 
most of the, there's 150,000 domestic wells out there, people who rely on groundwater for the well. If we strip irrigation out of here, we see that um, groundwater supplies a significant amount of public water supply. Say that Missoula, um, Kalispell, Sydney, those are all towns that rely on groundwater for their municipal supply. Virtually all the rural residences in Montana rely on groundwater for their supply. So yeah, groundwater, groundwater is important to our state. So as I mentioned, geology controls the hydrogeology. In, in, in Montana, when you look at Montana, we kind of have a split personality uh, with regard to uh, geology across our state. We've got, we're very different from the, from the west to the east. The west, we're in the Intermont northern intermontane physiographic pro province, characterized by these uh, uh, long mountain valleys with uh, the, the, the valley floors down dropped relative to the <coughs> mountains. Most of them are characterized by some crude flowing stream. And the eastern part of the state, east of the Rocky Mountain front, we're, we're in the Great Plains. So in the intermontane basins, again, we've got these series of basins, series of fault bounded basins, one after the other. And what this cross section just shows is we've got the, the bedrock, the mountains, the stuff that forms the mountains, separating these different alluvial valleys. The yellow represents alluvial deposits within these intermontane basins. And these alluvial deposits um, can be very thick and, and they all have very productive aquifers. All of them have a shallow, unconfined aquifer. These are the aquifers that would be directly connected to surface water resources. And many of them have um, confined or semi-confined aquifers buried at depth within them. And these are probably the most productive aquifers in the state. They're surrounded by fractured bedrock, the mountains. And the bedrock really never really was considered an aquifer much before, but we're seeing more and more wells drill into this fractured bedrock kind of settings as population pressure pushes up <coughs> along the margins of, um, of the valleys as people are expanding and trying to back up onto forest service land. And these aquifers have very, they, they behave very different hydrologically. Um, first of all, the, the groundwater in, a, in the bedrock, in the fractured bedrock, it's going to occur in the cracks and fractures within that rock. And so you can see that the success of any well that you drill is going to depend upon how many of those saturated cracks and fractures your well bore intercepts. And those can, it can be very hard to predict and it can be very variable. Um, the, the alluvium, on the other hand, you're pretty much anywhere you drill, you will hit water and you will get a good well. So in the eastern part of the state, in the Great Plains, we're looking at um, sedimentary bedrock aquifers. So those are the main aquifers, as well as alluvium in the major um, river valleys, the Yellowstone and the Missouri River Valley. But so we've got this alternating sequence of sandstone shale, sandstone shale, and then the Madison limestone down here at depth. The, the uppermost, the orange, this is the, uh, the Fort Union formation. Below the Fort Union formation, we've got the Hell, Fox Hills Hell Creek. Then there's some shale, and then there's the Judith River sandstone, some <coughs> shale, the Eagle sandstone, a lot of shale, the, the Lower Cretaceous Kootenai, a bunch of other units, and then you know down stratigraphically at depth, we've got the Madison limestone. Those, those are the main bedrock aquifers that we encounter out in um, eastern Montana. And with these, with these, was like, you, know, you can see what the aquifers look like where they're, where they're exposed at the surface. The Fort Union out in eastern Montana, it's also known uh, for its coal resources. Uh, it, it forms that uh, classic Badlands topography. Um, the, the Fox Hills Hell Creek occurs kind of in a, in a rim around it, but you know, we got to think in, in three dimensions, right? This is occurring below that, that uh, Fox Hills. The Kootenai Sands, Sandstone is, is uh, an important aquifer in, in the Judith Basin. And then uh, the Madison Limestone, which underlies most of the state, but it's, it's an important aquifer where it's exposed or close to the surface. It's, um, it's exposed on Little Belt Mountains near, near Great Falls, and it's, and it's utilized up here, but you go a little further to the north where it's further away from the outcrop where there's freshwater recharge and it's deeper into the subsurface. 
it's an oil and gas reservoir. So that's the background on our groundwater use and our aquifers. Now we'll kind of get into the meat of it. This is the distribution of wells that we monitor as part of our network. We have more than 900 wells. They're all there. Most of them have been monitored since uh, the early 90s. Some of them we have data going back into the 40s. Um, they're in all the, all the aquifers across the state. They're ranged from 10 to uh, 3,600 feet in depth. And what I'm going to do is give you five examples of some of the information we've been able to glean from our long-term monitoring and some of the different uh, stressors or impacts that are um, uh, operating on our, our groundwater resources. We'll start up around Great Falls and look at the Madison Aquifer and uh, how climate can influence water levels. We'll jump out to eastern Montana and look at the Fox Hills Hell Creek, which is experiencing depletion. We'll go back to the western part of the state and look at how land use affects water levels in, in the Bitterroot and Beaverhead Valleys, and then we'll end up in the Kalispell Valley where development has sort of uh, changed and actually now controls the, the seasonal water level response. So, um, Cascade County, Great Falls, this is uh, the, the Missouri River. And these three green dots are uh, three of the wells that are completed in the Madison limestone that are part of our monitoring network. Um, the Madison limestone, where it occurs at the surface, I have it outlined in blue here. It's, it occurs along the flanks of the Little Belt Mountains. And, and then it, it dips into the subsurface to the north. And uh, by the time you get to Great Falls, this Madison limestone is 450 feet below the surface. This is a cross section from here to here showing we've got where it, it, it uh, uh, crops out. And this is where it's at the surface. This is the primary recharge area. And when I'm talking about recharge, this is where the water gets into the aquifer. And in this particular aquifer, it's, it's a limestone aquifer. It's, it's got fracture solution porosity. The main mechanism of recharge is stream loss. As streams cross the outcrop, they lose flow into the aquifer. And that groundwater is flowing away from the topographically high area to the low area. And um, by the time you're at Great Falls, it's, it's, a, it's an artesian aquifer, and it's water actually from the Madison limestone that is um, forcing its way up through the overlying units um, to discharge at uh, Giant Springs. Giant Springs is sourced from the Madison limestone. And um, the Madison limestone is most heavily used as an aquifer or for a, for a water source in Cascade County. As I mentioned, it occurs around the state, but it's not used wide, in, in widespread areas because it, for the most part it's too deep, or can, and where it is deep, it contains saline water. <coughs> Statewide, 85% um, of the wells that are completed in the Madison Limestone are up in the Great Falls area. And so we have these three wells that we've been monitoring water levels in. And we started monitoring in the early 90s. And, and initially, these, what you're seeing right here is the water levels and uh, reported as uh, depth below the surface. And then I'm also showing here the number of wells in the aquifer on this scale. And so we started monitoring for a couple of years. Things are pretty stable. And then all of a sudden, the water level starts to plummet. <coughs> water level dropped about 30 feet um, in, in five years. And during that same time, the number of wells in the aquifer doubled. That's what we're seeing here, nearly doubled. So based on, based on this information, it seemed like we were starting to deplete the aquifer. We've got this, all of a sudden this enhanced development. We're taking all, all these wells in the aquifer. We're taking more water out that's coming in. But then after 2005, the, the, the decline stopped. The groundwater development continued at the same pace, but the water level decline stopped and recovered. Uh, to, today, where the groundwater levels in, in the aquifer are higher than they were when we first started measuring. So obviously, something else besides groundwater pumping is controlling the water levels in this aquifer. And what it is, is right around 2000, we, that's when we went into this pretty severe drought. What I'm showing here is a plot of um, departure from average precipitation in the Great Falls area. 
and we had this period, this, this drought period of five or six years, and the water levels dropped. We flipped, flipped back over into the wet period, the water levels recovered. So it's not so much that we're taking more water out, it's that we're not putting as much in, and the water is just, just draining out. So while groundwater development certainly might have some influence, the primary control on the Madison limestone aquifer is, is climate precipitation. All right, now we're going to jump out to the eastern part of the state um, and look at the, talk about the Fox Hills Hell Creek aquifer. I've outlined in green here where the Fox Hills Hell Creek is exposed at the surface. This, um, this is the Yellowstone River Valley here, uh, Sydney, Glendive is right here. The Fox Hills is a, is a, is a widespread um, sandstone unit. Underlies, it underlies all of eastern Montana and into the North Dakota and Saskatchewan and Manitoba. It underlies the Wilson Basin. But it's, but it's an important aquifer in eastern Montana and in um, North Dakota and Saskatchewan and Manitoba also um, <coughs> produce water from the Fox Hills Hell Creek. So we've got records of about 1,800 wells. Most of these wells were um, drilled um, before 1975. And the Fox Hills Hell Creek is, is, a, is a classic confined aquifer. This is a cross section along the Yellowstone River Valley. <coughs> and you see at the surface we've got Port Union Formation, then mudstones of the Hell Creek, and then below that, so we've got mudstones of the Hell Creek, then we've got the Fox Hill Sandstone, and then below that, Pierre Shale. So we've got that kind of sandwich. We've got mudstone, sandstone, shale, and it's kind of doing this. It's kind of dipping into the, dipping into the subsurface. Water enters, the aquifer, water enters the aquifer where it's exposed at the surface and, and flows deeper. And so by the time we're um, in the Yellowstone River Valley here, it's about uh, 1,000 to 1,800 feet deep. But it's under, it's the water in the aquifer is under a pressure, under artesian pressure. And um, many of the wells, especially in the topographic low areas, will flow with wind drilled. So this aquifer was developed um, developed, as I said, um, in the 50s and 60s quite a bit, especially in some of these remote areas where they were just small diameter wells, they were easy to drill, and um, they, didn't, they were small diameter because they didn't need a pump, and they reached the stock water wells. And a, and, a, and a flowing artesian well out in a very remote area where there's no electricity is a pretty valuable commodity. And so what I've shown here in red are all the wells that were reported flowing at the time they were drilled. And this is a chart just showing the number of wells and the depth. And you see, um, you know, a lot of these wells in here, they're uh, 800 to 1,800 feet deep. And so we've got this sort of widespread development. And a lot of these stock wells, they were just, um, they're, they're not valved at all. So they're just flowing. There's just all this unregulated <coughs> discharge coming out of these um, stock wells. And we have a we have a well completed in the Fox Hills that we've been that we have been going back in the 80s near Terry, and what we see is just a steady long-term decline in the water level in that aquifer. This development, the, the the unregulated discharge from these flowing wells, were basically just bleeding the pressure off of this aquifer, and we know that. The, um, uh, Low, groundwater flow rates in the Fox Hills are very slow. In other words, it, so it takes a long time for water to recharge it. We see no little blip, no little seasonal trend, or no kind of climatic curve. This is just kind of a classic depletion response. We're taking, we are taking water out of this aquifer faster than it's going in. We're mining the water out of the Fox Hills in this area. All right, now let's jump over to the Bitterroot. Um, in western Montana, Bitterroot Valley is a, it's a classic example of intermontane basin. Uh, we've got the north flowing Bitterroot River. Hamilton's down here, Missoula is up here. This is the Bitterroot Range, the Sapphire Range. These are folk mountains, so it's been down dropped. And then within, within the Bitterroot Valley itself, we have um, several thousand feet, up to several thousand feet of basin filled sediments. And this is um, just a photo standing um, on the east side of the valley looking to the west toward the Bitterroot Mountains. And these heavy, dark blue lines, these are the main irrigation canals in the Bitterroot Valley. And this is, this is the main irrigation canal right here at Bankville. 
the bitter rubber itself is not here somewhere. Um, the two green dots are two wells that we have in our monitoring network that are completed in the same offer, the shaft of the alluvium of, of the Bitterroot Valley. So the Bitterroot Valley, land use from the Bitterroot Valley, historically it's been irrigated agriculture. And um, the yellow outlines the, the extent of the basin for the topic. The little green blotches are um, irrigated uh, parcels. And then we've got the irrigation canal. So in the Bitterroot Valley, we divert 374,000 acre feet of water out of Bitterroot to irrigate 85,000 acres. So an acre foot is the amount of water to cover one acre of land and one foot of water. If you do the math, um, that means we're, we're diverting four and a half feet of water for each acre that we're irrigating. Now the crops don't need that much water. The crops need a foot and a half. So the question is, what's what's happening to most of the water that we're diverting? Some of it, of course, is going to run back into the water, in, into the river. Some's going to evaporate. But a large amount of this water recharges the shallow groundwater system. How do we know this? Well, from our from our monitoring well record. So we have these two wells in the Bitterroot Valley. This well up by Florence is outside of the area of irrigation. The irrigation kind of ends just by Florence. And this, so this well is in the alluvium on the west side of the Bitterroot Valley. And you see, we see this very regular trace to the hydrograph. So again, this is just the water level fluctuation over time in this well. And we see water levels come up in the spring, uh, so the spring runoff, drop over the summer and fall into the winter months and do it all over again. And if I were to put a plot of Bitterroot River discharge on here, it would look very much like this in terms of the timing and the magnitude of the discharge. So it's pretty much in sync. And I, I would suggest to you that what we're seeing here kind of represents you know, natural background conditions in the shallow aquifer in the Bitterroot Valley. Down here at Hamilton, it's a very different story, very different response. This well is directly down gradient from areas of irrigation and the two main canals. And what we see is every year, as soon as they start running water through the ditches, the water level in this well jumps up about 10 feet, stays elevated over the course of the summer. As soon as they take the stop running water through the ditches, the water levels plummet. And we see the same thing year in, year out. Same timing, same magnitude, just a very consistent, uniform response. This is controlled by um, irrigation leakage. If we just take and plot the average monthly water levels from our, from our record, this is what it looks like. And, I was, and, and so the difference between, so this is the well up um, near Florence. We see that the you know, water levels come up around two feet, whereas here they come up maybe two feet in the spring and drop back down. The difference between these two curves kind of represents the, the amount of water that the aquifer in this part of the valley receives from irrigation recharge, irrigation. So that it's, the aquifer in this part of the valley is getting five to ten times the amount of recharge than the aquifer up here outside of the area of irrigation. So it's a significant component of, um, of groundwater recharge. And, 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 the other, and what's the other thing that's significant, so these canals have been here for a hundred years. This process has been going on for a hundred years. And these canals, especially the upper canal, it goes up along um, the base of the, uh, of, the, of the Sapphire Mountains and up along there, if you've ever been down the Bitterroot Valley, there's a series of, of uh, tertiary benches along that east side of the valley. This, these canals have created a whole series of dependent <coughs> systems. There are shallow aquifers up on, these, um, uh, up on these east side benches that wouldn't be there without the canals. There's, in, in the east side of the, the, east side of the Bitterroot is, is much more arid than the west side. There's, there's wetland areas. Up, up on these upland benches that wouldn't be there without the canals. There's these lush riparian areas that are uh, supported by um, recharge from these canals. You know, so groundwater, groundwater is part of the hydrologic cycle. It doesn't just go into the subsurface and sit there. It's moving. It's flowing. So it's going to express itself somewhere, either at, in the wetlands, the riparian areas, or as base flow to the uh, to the bitterroot. And so we see that. Um, uh, Bitterroot base flow gets a little kick in, in the fall from these irrigation returns.
And now, um, staying in southwest Montana, we'll just jump over to the Beaverhead Valley. So this is Dillon. This is the Beaverhead River, the North Point Beaverhead River. We've got uh, the Ruby Mountains, and, and kind of draped off the, the um, western flank of the Rubies is this apron of, uh, of tertiary sediments, and it, it forms the, the East Bench, it's called the East Bench. And it's, um, it's about, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty prominent escarpment where the beaverhead, the modern beaverhead, uh, has cut into this, this bench, and so it's 250, 300 feet topographically above the Bitterroot River floodplain. And we have a well that's up on this bench, and we have some water level measurements back from the, from the early 60s that show that um, at that time, the groundwater level below the east bench was about 170 feet below the surface. Well, in 1966, the East Bench Canal started operation. So the, the East Bench Canal delivers water from Clark Canyon Reservoir. It goes through the Bitterroot. There's a diversion at Barracks. And it delivers water up along the East Bench to irrigate, um, to irrigate the East Bench. So we've got the canal goes in, and then the water level in this well comes up 40 to 50 feet. And what I'm plotting here is the, is the water level, and this other trace is going to be the, the diversions from um, uh, for the east bench. And so, you know, they're diverting around 10,000 acre feet of water a year down that canal. So, because then in the 60s, um, there's, there's just kind of sporadic measurements through the 80s, uh, but the measurements we do have suggest that the, that the water level is still elevated relative to the pre-canal base. And what I've got here is a Landsat image from 1985 kind of showing the extent of, of irrigation on the canal. And so the canal, the, the diversions are pretty consistent. It appears the water levels have, have, have uh, come up and, and, and remain pretty consistent. We, we started monitoring this well as part of our program in, in the early 90s, and, it, and so we increased the frequency of the measurement. And we see that there's some seasonality to that signal. But also looks like there's kind of a, what I call a climate trace. So it, it's sort of you, you see it's kind of doing these big, big swings, and it seems to be a little bit of sync with um, canal diversions. Uh, and again, this is a, a Landsat image from from 2000. That's when the drought hits, right? So 2000 drought hits. The diversions for the East Bench Canal steadily plummet through the early 2000s to the point that in 2004, no water was diverted through the East Bench. <clears throat> and this shows the Landsat image from 2004, and you can see there was virtually no, um, egg, no irrigated agriculture happening on the East Bench as a result. And so we see what's happening at the surface, what's happening in the subsurface. Well, the groundwater levels are following right behind. You know, there's kind of this lag, but in 2005, the water level in this well was pretty much approaching um, pre-canal level. So the canal gets turned back on. We're, we're back diverting at uh, kind of historic levels, and our water level has come back up. And this is the landside image from uh, a couple of years ago. So things are kind of coming back up to, up to normal. So, the question is, you know, how much water do these canals leak? How much, how much is it that they contribute to the <coughs> Well, we had um, our CRAC groundwater investigations program down in the Beaverhead Valley that did a very intensive uh, study of the Beaverhead. They're like our hydrogeologic SWAT team. <laughs> They're like SEAL Team Six. <laughs> they go in there and uh, they they uh, they get her done. And one of the things they did was they did a they did a seepage study of that canal along se 17 miles of the canal. They they, they monitored at, at six points to monitor to measure um, how much water is being lost <coughs> on that canal. And what they found was that um, in places the canal would lose as much as five cubic feet per second per mile. Five CFS 
per mile. In average, on average, over the over the it was it was two CFS per mile. So well, so how much is that? Well, that's four acre feet per day. Four acre feet per mile per day. That's more than a million gallons of water <coughs> per day leaking per mile. So the canal is 40 miles long. That's a, you know, that, it's, it's a lot of water. How much groundwater does, gets withdrawn out of Beaverhead County? Beaverhead County is one of the areas <coughs> where groundwater is used a lot. I think Dillon gets their municipal supply. There's, um, there is um, a fair amount of irrigation uh, pumpage in, in Beaverhead County. Beaverhead County uses an estimate an estimated seven and a half million gallons of water a day. This canal is losing, you know, a million gallons of water per day per month. So, you know, volumetrically, it's huge how much water is being recharged by these canals. We, re we put through these canals, and, 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 it's, and we see this throughout western Montana, the irrigation canals, we basically have this massive artificial recharge system that's been in place. And, um, um, uh, we, we put through through these leaky canals. We put more water into the ground than we take out. All right. Final example. Um, we're going to jump up into the Kalispell Valley. <coughs> this is uh, Flathead Lake. We've got the, the city of Kalispell, uh, Flathead River flowing down here, um, Swan Range, Salus Range, and the uh, um, Flathead Range up here, and the. The Kalispell Valley is really unique in terms of the intermontane basins in Montana in that the, uh, the, there, there's some very productive, prolific surficial aquifers. The alluvium between the Flathead River and the Whitefish River, there's a, a very clean sand. But it's shallow, it's close to the surface. It's very susceptible to surface sources of contamination. But then there's a layer of glacial till and glacial uh, lake silts. And below that is a very permeable sand that underlies essentially the, the entire basin, as far as we can tell. And um, it's just called the, 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 the deep aquifer. I think that the last lobe of the glacier that came down through here was, 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 was shedding this outwash sand and gravel in front of it. And then the glacier overrode it and kind of slapped the till on top of it. And no real idea, we, we, it's encountered at about 200 to 400 <coughs> feet below the surface. But we don't really know how thick it is. But we do know that it's very productive, um, and the water quality is excellent. It's just very, uh, very pure water in this aquifer. <coughs> and we have a well just north of Kalispell um, that's been monitored going back into the 60s. And this is the, uh, the records of the wells that we had completed in the aquifer, you know, at this time, kind of in 1970. But you see at this time, uh, pretty regular, just sort of seasonal response, a little bit of rise in the spring. You know, it looked like it was just in a, in a, uh, just a, a state of natural equilibrium. Equilibrium. Well, then, starting beginning in the early 70s through the early 80s, the number of wells in the deep aquifer tripled. The number of irrigation wells in the deep aquifer tripled, and that's really the significant thing. Is that you know, the, it's, this was a time when, when mint farming really started to take off in, in the Flathead Valley, and it's a water-intensive crop. And um, it's the irrigation wells that really extract a, a, a lot of water. And so what happened? The water levels, instead of just kind of happily marching along, they start, to, they start to decline, and they're not recovering. The development continues. Um, and the water level decline continued till around 1990, and then things kind of seem to stabilize. So this is, we've got this aquifer that's in a state of equilibrium. It gets developed. What happens when you develop an aquifer? The first thing that happens is water's removed from storage. And that's what I think is, is reflected in this hydrograph. And then eventually, a new equilibrium is reached. And I would suggest that it looks like we, we might have achieved a new equilibrium, but we have um, a very different um, seasonal response now. Before, we had this kind of natural uh, water level response, water levels coming up and down a few feet. Now we see a response that's totally controlled by the seasonal pumping for irrigation. And 
if we look at these two different parts of the hydrograph in a little bit more detail, back here, you know, a, again, we had water, this kind of what I would characterize just as a natural response, water levels coming up in the spring, like we see rivers come up in the spring. Um, and then dropping during the summer, fall, and winter months, coming back up again in the spring. Um, now what we see is that the seasonal lows occur in the summer. And so we get this sharp decline in water levels once, when, when the irrigation season starts and, and, and the pumps turn on. And then water levels in the aquifer are recovering. They're rising over the fall and the winter months until the next pumping season starts and, and boom, they, they go down. So, so we see that this development has totally changed the, um, the magnitude and timing of uh, the water level response in the deep aquifer in the Kalispell Valley. And, and that's all I got. And again, I, I hope one of the things that the takeaway is that you know, we have these, these, these different, groundwater isn't just one big pool on, under the ground. It occurs in these aquifers, and aquifers have different characteristics. And, and, it, and then they have different development histories and different ways to recharge. And all these things are going to determine um, uh, how much water there is in the aquifer. And the only way we can determine um, what's going on in the aquifer is by, by measuring it, by monitoring it. And so we need to, um, uh, and it's the, these long-term records that provide you know, the fundamental indicator of, of the aquifer's uh, status, and they, they help us understand how the aquifers work. And if we're going to develop you know, meaningful um, strategies to um, <coughs> sustainably develop and protect and manage the groundwater, this is the type of information that's critical. And what I've got here is, and I'd like to acknowledge um, Luke Buckley, who manages our Groundwater Information Center. This is a relatively new product that Luke has developed. <laughs> you can go on our website, and this is an interactive map. All these green triangles are wells that are in our monitoring network. And so you can go to this map, and you can click on one, and it will bring up the hydrograph and show you what's happening um, at, at that well. And so Luke has done a great job of helping us with our, with our charge, our mission of disseminating in, in, information. And I have, um, I have a couple other acknowledgments. Um, uh, the main one, I think, is uh, for Tom Patton, the, the, guy, uh, the guy who introduced me. Tom was the one who laid all the groundwork and came up with the initial design for this network. And uh, it would not be here were it not for Tom. Tom's efforts in the Montana network have been recognized at a national level. Montana, th there's an effort right now to try to get a national groundwater monitoring network established. Um, and they did a little pilot study where they, they looked around the state, they looked around to different states to try to get, uh, see where states were with their um, groundwater monitoring. Montana was selected as a state with the most comprehensive and complete monitoring network, to use as, as the example on that end. And, and, and today, Tom is still involved in, in efforts with, there's a, there's a national subcommittee on groundwater, and Tom is um, very much involved with that group. Uh, and then, of course, every one of the dots on these graphs represents somebody going to a well and making a measurement. And we have a crew <laughs> of, I would say, the most dedicated, hardworking, um, people who go out and, and visit these wells and make these measurements. And uh, they've probably seen more of Montana, more of the back roads of Montana than, than all of us combined in this room. But they really do a great job of servicing our network. And everything I showed you today would not be possible without um, these people. So that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> we've got uh, we have the flat liner Mike, you mean? Yeah, we've got the uh, the irrigator. We've got the uh, bad neighbor. We've got the Madisonian. Uh, we got we have the tater head. We have the um, the old switcheroo where we had MSU student A measuring here and MSU student B measuring there. Um, we have the uh, the dot. 
and uh, the question to ponder, is this a graph? <laughs> now, this, is, uh, this is the guys who, this is their work and they never <laughs> at all. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, Beth. Yeah, so, a lot of very interesting thing is happening with the groundwater, and it's particularly visible when people do something like put a canal in, put more wells in, and all that. Is there any information on the age of the water that's being pumped out at different times? I mean, how long has it been down there? Does it go in at the top? Is it the Madison who goes down to Great Falls? Does it go in in the Madison in January and come out in Great Falls in June? Yeah. That or does, does it go in in, in Great in you know in the Mad in in 1990 and come out in 2040? That's I mean, right. There's a whole lot of different there, time scales. Absolutely. And so the question is, is how um, do we know something about groundwater ages in in these different aquifer? The answer is yeah, and the way we, one of the main tools we use is to, is to look at um, isotopes. Uh, there, there are certain isotopes that, that occur in the atmosphere and, and, and they get dissolved in the water and then as they infiltrate down in the ground and get incorporated into the groundwater system, they're, they're, they're cut off and so that sort of starts, starts a clock. And your, 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 your question about the Madison is a, is a, is a great one because um, Giant Springs, I don't know if you've been to Giant Springs up in Great Falls, beautiful, beautiful springs, it's a huge spring. Lewis and Clark stopped there on, on their way. And there was, a, um, there was a study done back in the 70s where somebody age dated that water using carbon-14. So just like an archaeologist uses carbon-14 to age date, you can look at the dissolved inorganic carbon in, in, in water and use it at, to, uh, to date water. And what they came up with was, was that it's thousands of years old. And um, we went and did some sampling there, and we sampled for some other things. There's, there's also an isotope called tritium. It's a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, and it, it's incorporated into the water molecule. And, and, and it has a short half-life, so it has a half-life of 12 years. So basically, if you collect a sample of water, and it has tritium, tritium, detectable amounts of tritium, tritium in it, it tells you that that water had to have been recharged since basically 1960. Well, we went and sampled giant streams. It was loaded with tritium. So that did not jive with an age of 3,000 years. We also sampled it for carbon-14. The thing, carbon, the, the, yeah, there are other sources of carbon. And I think what, the, what happened was the, and, and we also sampled the spring for chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs which are a totally synthetic compound. They're a man-made compound that have been used in aerosols and, and refrigerants, and they're, they're in the atmosphere. And so if you find CFCs in the water, that tells you it had to have been, you know, gives it a constraint. And actually, there are concentration curves in the atmosphere where you can look at your concentration in the water and you know, do some Henry's Law corrections and try to find where that concentration plots on the atmosphere curve to give you an idea of when that water was in the atmosphere, and so that would kind of give you a start date. We found that it, the water coming out of Giant Springs, based on our CFCs analysis, was, was 23 years old, that it was taking 23 years for water to come from the Little Belt Mountains to Giant Springs, not 2,300 years, which was what the other said. So, kind of a long way to say, so yeah, the, and, and we also sampled the, the Fox Hills Aquifer that's out in eastern Montana, they showed, we did some carbon-14 sampling in that aquifer, and we found the water in that was arguably tens of thousands of years old. And so um, what that was telling us was that you know, groundwater moves. It's part of the hydrologic cycle, right? But it moves much more slowly than surface water. So surface water might be moving at one foot per second. Groundwater um, might be moving at a couple feet per year. And or 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 a foot per day, you know. So the high end, fast groundwater movement would be a foot per day. That would be pretty <coughs> rapid movement for groundwater. The Fox Hills Hill Creek, we found water levels were moving on the floor of one foot per year. And so when you get to be 30 miles from the outcrop, you know that's a lot of years. And so, so the answer is yes. There are ways you can date groundwater, and the dating we've done has shown that um, it's very variable. Um, in Montana. But generally speaking, the shallow unconfined aquifers, um, water is on their order of maybe years. 
the deeper confined bedrock aquifers, then you're getting into decades to centuries to thousands of years. Do you know what to what extent your information is being used by county planners? Do we know how much our information is being used by county planners? We hope we hope a lot. You know, we we track um, um, we track our website to see how many hits we get, and I think we're averaging thirty thousand. I can't remember what the last. A lot of people come visit our website and, and take take information, and we try to do we try to get the word out that this information is is available. We were there. there the State Department of Natural Resources just concluded uh, a, revising the Montana State Water Plan. And so they had different basins across the state looking at issues in their basins. And we were, we tried to be very active at, um, as technical advisors to those groups, mainly to let them know that we have this kind of information. To what extent it's used? Yeah, I, we, know, we know some people use it. We hope a lot more will. Some, some good, some bad. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It goes in that spot. Yeah, Doug. What, what criteria go into selecting or locating a monitoring well? Yeah, well, that's a good question. That's one, of, and one of the things about our network, when when this program was established, we had no budget to drill wells. I think it, initially, that we took a look around the state and said, "Gosh, there's a hundred thousand wells. You guys pick from those." So we. Um, we call them, most of our wells are what we call the wells of opportunity. Those wells that might be in an aquifer that we want to monitor um, and that have a cooperative landowner. But the thing, so we look for a well where we know something about the construction details so we know exactly what it is we're monitoring. And um, is it easily accessible? Do we have a willing to handle it? Uh, we, and, I'll, and I'll let Tom chime in too since he did a lot of selection. Uh, in the west, particularly western Montana valleys, it, it was a really hard thing to do because you have 40,000 wells in the Bitterroot Basin of these kinds of wells, plus a few dedicated wells you may know about, and you want to get into wells that are dedicated to the purpose if you can. You want to get into a well that has a period of record, because you're buying decades sometimes. So you look for that old monitoring well that the GS might have drilled in the 1950s that's still out there you can pick up and use. So that's one component. But the overall plan would be uh, a budget of 50 wells or 30 wells in the Bitterroot Valley. You got 15,000 out there maybe to pick from. But you want uh, some up gradient on both sides, mid gradient on both sides, down gradient in the middle, a set of transects. Because you have a budget of uh, 500 wells across the state, you can spend 30 of them in the Bitterroot. So you're looking for a snapshot of the flow system. With the caveats, can you get to this well? Will that well actually produce the data you want? Does it have a period of record that goes back? Because you can buy decades that way. You, you can't get back otherwise. So those are all components, and it, you don't really know. I spent a lot of time trying to decide which is the best well. Which is the best well? And there's no way from this side of that coin without going and measuring those wells for a while to know what is the best well. You just have to pick them and uh, see what they produce, and then modify as you, as you go. But that's the basic framework, is the flow system, the, it, as you understand it within any piece of the overall state. John, you mentioned the 3600 well, where, where's that? Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, no, 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 that's so deep, and I just, that, that stuck in my head like I want to know. Huh? I think it's a deep, uh, deep test, old deep test well that was completed as a water well in the prior conglomerate, conglomerate out south of Billings. I think that's it. Wow. And it was, you know, they drilled the oil and gas test, got completed as a water well, got left. Quality or whatever other problems really prevent much use to it. And so it's there. It's the only prior conglomerate well you're going to get in the basin period out there unless you one I cough up and drill one. So, and uh, the other thing I did want to say is in those wells of opportunity, one of the other components is you look for the well that's low use. There's a danger there is the well that's low use because it doesn't work very well. It could also be a well of low use because the landowner just no longer needs that well. And so it's just there. If he's not using it, 
you can use it to work out an agreement to go major. And one of the things we're, we are trying it to um, to build up, which is just our, our permanent monitoring right. infrastructure, so we can we can drill what we can put wells in the places that we want them, completed at the depths that we want them, and that we know that they're not going to be used and are going to give us reliable. <coughs> Tom or John, can you comment on California? That it's they west of here, and they have lots of faults and earthquakes. <laughs> I think they have, they have local networks. They have local water quality, essentially local water districts. But they don't have a, no, they, they do not have a, any kind of like comprehensive or unified state network. No, but it's coming. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I'm trying to remember what, what uh, Parker, Tim Parker said he's been an instrument, he's a consultant in in California. Uh, he runs his own sh shop, uh, but he's been pretty politically active. And they have actually, with this drought that they're going through, actually created legislation now that they do have to file their well logs, that they do have to uh, begin to establish groundwater management districts that are coordinated with each other. I don't know all the details because it's out there. They have lots of faults and earthquakes. It's west of here, but uh, I can tell you that kind of thing. But their, their, their outlook is changing based on this current massive drought that they're undergoing and the, the, the individually monitored and a whole bunch of little fragmented networks uh, declines in water up. So it's changing out there from what we kind of know of it is, is you know, it's the, uh, you know, there's no, I can't remember if it's a property right, I think that's Texas, but the... It's a different right. water right system. It's a whole different have. water right system. It's not prior appropriation or anything like that, so... And uh, it's, I don't think it's a property right where in Texas where if the water's under your land and you can get it, it's yours no matter what happens to James over here, so... Did that answer? It's, it's changing for probably more towards a system like we're going to. Bill, do you have a thought on that? you know? Okay. But I, I mean, this is something that came out of their legislature this past summer, so it's that new. Could you actually comment on um, the Bureau Groundwater. <laughs> 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 uh, are you talking about groundwater assessment or just sort of the monitoring concept? Well, the, the monitoring and the and the, the this database that is freely available to the public. Well, everybody, I would say almost every state has some sort of a wells database anymore. Uh, we started in the early 1990s. We actually went online. I think. In 1999, we had our first web presence. We had a dial-up uh, multiplexer kind of thing through modems before that for a very select group of users. 1999, we went online with a website uh, that allowed you to get some portion of the well log. Uh, the USGS got their NWIS, Natural Water Information System, on a few years later. They had an older database like like ours as well. But every state now has some sort of uh, uh, state database of well logs. The difference that we tend to have is that we have built it, first of all, from the point of view of two points of view. One, the hydrogeologist who might be using it. So we link water levels to the well log, we link water quality to the well log, we link geology to the well log, and we link whatever else we could to the well log that people like hydrogeologists want to use. And then we also managed to make that well log itself uh, easily available through the systems that people like to use, like Township and Range, now just mappers, uh, to, uh, to get, their, get their well log or the neighbor's well log, or I'm going to buy this house, what does the wells in the nearby look like? And so we were, our difference is that we linked all these things together as well as making it available to the outside general public. And that served us well. And one other thought I have on that is we're an older system in the sense that we, when we started doing this, when Marvin Miller and John Sonderager and Bob Bergantino started doing this back in the late 70s, trying to keystroke on cards the well log information, 
scanners weren't around. You didn't scan anything. You had to key punch it. And so we key punched and began it. We began key punching, building these data records. We morphed those ultimately into the system we have now. And that was an advantage in that we then had the scanners later on to scan all the original information and attach that to that digital information. So instead of having just scans of well logs that you have to go and read it and type it out, we have the tabled information off the entire document as well as the scan. So it's a function of when we started, the size of the state, only 200,000 wells instead of 2 million wells is a function of, that, of how it came about. And the late arrival of the scanner in our, point, in our uh, situation where you could scan an, an image, attach it by an ID to that digital record, and have, have it all versus a Washington State or California. Now, they may have three million well logs, they're all scanned images. And you can't get that table of three million well logs out of the computer, take those locations to your computer, do something with them. That's our, our advantage, so people want to follow that model. And the National Groundwater Monitoring Network is taking networks like ours, like Texas, like Wisconsin, uh, who have online databases with web services where you can go in through the back door and ask for that data, that water level data, and run it through a portal system so that across the nation, no matter what the back end database looks like, you get a hydrograph that looks from Montana, physic that looks much like a hydrograph from Texas. Data sets are different. The system has, you ask the system for hydrographs from Texas and Montana together, it goes out to individual databases, gets the, da gets the data, mediates them into a data retrieval you can look at and you can compare apples and apples in that sense from water levels across the state. And Texas and Montana is not a good example, but in our case, Montana and North Dakota is a good example. Because in North Dakota, in the Fox Hills, Hell Creek, uh, they monitor, uh, but they're not part of the National Monitoring Network. So you, if you wanted water level data from, from North Dakota, you'd have to go to North Dakota and get it. You can come to us to get it. Or you could go to the National Network, make a require of both systems, Montana and North Dakota together, should both be part of the National Network, and get the data sets you want across the, across the state boundaries. That's kind of its goal. Too much of an answer, sorry. <laughs> Great talk. Thank you, John.